I invite you to turn back to Matthew 17. As we come to God's Word, I'll just read the first five verses of Matthew 17. Refocus us. I'll consider, or we will consider the first 13 verses this afternoon, but we'll just read the first five again. Now, after six days, Jesus took Peter, James, and John, his brother, led them up on a high mountain by themselves, and he was transfigured before them. His face shone like the sun, and his clothes became as white as the light. And behold, Moses and Elijah appeared to them, talking with them. And then Peter answered and said to Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If you wish, let us make here three tabernacles, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. While he was still speaking, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them. And suddenly a voice came out of the cloud, saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Hear him. Congregation, the Apostle John, who is one of the three disciples privileged to witness the transfiguration, says at the beginning of his gospel in John chapter 1, the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father. He says that the eternal God who became flesh shows us his glory. We have to wonder as we read that if John was not thinking, at least in part, of the transfiguration when he wrote that. God showing us in Christ his glory certainly left a mark on Peter as he writes of it in 2 Peter chapter 1 and says, We were eyewitnesses of his majesty, for he received from the Father honor and glory when we were with him on the mountain. And so the the two of of these three disciples who lived to write of it spoke of the honor and glory that they beheld here in Jesus Christ. And so we see that one of the reasons Christ came into the world is to reveal his glory. And so this afternoon as we consider the transfiguration, we, we want to consider three things. First, the glory of God's beloved Son. We want to behold the glory of Jesus as it is revealed here in His Word in Matthew 17. Second, the confusion of Christ's disciple. And then third, the paradox of the gospel, the glory of God's beloved Son, the confusion of Christ's disciple, and the paradox of the gospel. Um, First, look with me at the glory of of God's beloved Son. I think that we see this in at least three ways in the passage before us. The first way that we see Christ's glory is in his transformed appearance. Did you notice any similarities between this passage here in Matthew and that one that we read from Exodus? And there we saw that Moses, when he came down from Mount Sinai after meeting with God, had a face that, that shined so brightly that the people were afraid to come near him. And so he would cover his face with a veil because the glory he reflected was simply too much for the people to bear. Moses, as the mediator of the covenant, reflected God's glory and the people could not bear it. It was a terrifying thing. We find something similar in our passage where Christ's face shines like the face of Moses, only Christ's is not merely a reflection of God's glory, it is the real thing. We might say that Moses was like the moon that that reflects the glory and brightness of the sun, though possessing no glory in and of itself, but Christ is like the sun, the radiance of God's glory shining forth, not the mere reflection, but the real thing. In fact, verse 2 tells us explicitly that he was like the sun. His face shone like the sun. And so we ha- here we have the, the light of the world come into the world far more radiant than Moses. That's the first way that we see the glory of God's beloved son. But notice also the garments. Think about how uh, Moses' garments were able to conceal his glory. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, in a sort of commentary on Exodus 34, says that the veil nullified it. 
Christ's garments, however, were not able to conceal his glory. Rather, his glory penetrated the very clothes that he wore. Verse 2 tells us his clothes became white as the light. Have you ever seen a light that is so bright you, you can't even look at it? Matthew tells us that's what Christ's clothes were like. They could not even look at the brightness. And so we see a parallel between Moses and Christ. Moses' veil covered his glory. Christ's could not. For Christ is not merely God's servant like Moses. He is God's son, begotten of the Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, as we confess in the Nicene Creed. And here the glory of Christ, which is veiled by his human flesh, shines forth for but a moment that we might see him as he truly is. You sometimes hear those words at Christmas time, veiled in flesh, the Godhead see, hail the incarnate deity. That Christ, as he assumes our flesh, veils his glory as he takes on our frailty. But here on the Mount of Transfiguration, we are reminded of who he truly is. Like the way one writer put it, he says the transfiguration is not so much a new miracle as it is the temporary cessation of an ongoing miracle. The real miracle was that Christ, most of the time, kept from displaying his glory. But here he gives us a peek as as the dullness of his earthly condition is, is sort of peeled back for just a moment that we might behold him as he truly is. The word became flesh and dwelt among us and we beheld his glory. The same glory Moses himself longed to see. We, we read a moment ago from Exodus 34. Had we uh, read just a little bit before that in chapter 33, you might recall when, when Moses pleads with God, please show me your glory. And God says to him, you cannot see my face for no man shall see me and live. But I will show you my back as I will put you in the cleft of a rock and I will pass by you and you shall see my back, but you shall not see my face. And yet here on the Mount of Transfiguration, as Moses and Elijah appear, Moses' request is granted. God gives him what he asked for some 1,500 years earlier to behold the glory of God in the face of his Son. Irenaeus said Moses' vision in Matthew 17 fulfills his ancient request. Tertullian said his desire to see the face of God is in fact a desire to see the face of his son and that desire is now granted and fulfilled. We don't fully understand how this worked. How was it that Moses and Elijah were present? Is this a vision? Are they, are they there bodily? Whatever the case, these two Old Testament prophets behold the one they longed to see. And not only does God allow them to behold his face, but but he also testifies to Christ's glory in the very fact that these men are brought there to behold him. And so Christ's glory is emphasized by both the transformation of his appearance and now by the company of Moses and Elijah. And you might ask the question, why these two men? Why is it that Moses and Elijah come and appear before Christ? Well, what do we know about Moses and Elijah? Both of their lives end in a less than normal way as Elijah is brought to heaven and Moses dies alone with God on Mount Nebo. Both are associated with the coming of the Messiah. Deuteronomy 18 promises that a prophet like Moses would come. Malachi 4 says that Elijah will prepare the way for the coming of the Messiah. Both Moses and Elijah suffer rejection from the people of God to whom they're sent, and both are representatives of the Old Testament prophets. And so the question why Moses and Elijah, I think one writer is correct when he says these two men represent the whole prophetic thrust of the Old Testament that is about to yield to the glory of this prophet like Moses who will ascend into heaven like Elijah. They represent the whole prophetic thrust of the Old Testament that is about to give way to this one whom they behold. 
And so these men testify to Christ in their prophetic ministry. They testify to Christ in everything that they are and represent. They testify to Christ in both their sufferings and their glory. And so the Lord brings them back to bear witness to the glory of Christ and then disappear because their job is done now that they have witnessed to Christ and so they disappear. God brings them back to show us this one whom they foretold, that this is the long-expected Jesus born to set thy people free, that this is indeed the Son of Righteousness, even as he is shining like the sun. He is the Son of Righteousness, who Malachi 4 foretold. And so Christ's glory is underlined both by his radiance and by his witnesses, and then also by his Father. His father is the third witness who testifies to his glory as he thunders forth in those words, this is my beloved son. Reminds us of the confession of Peter in chapter 16 at that sort of turning point in Matthew's gospel where Jesus asks, who who do people say that I am? And they say, some say that you are a prophet like Jeremiah or, or like Elijah. And Jesus says, but who do you say that I am? And Peter makes that spirit wrought confession that you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And here God says, this is my beloved son. This voice from heaven confirms what Peter had said in just the prior chapter. This voice from heaven confirms again what it already said at Christ's baptism. This is my beloved son, with whom I am well pleased. But it's not only the voice of the Father that witnesses to the glory of Christ, it's also the presence of God symbolized in this cloud that appeared just as Uh, In the Old Testament, a cloud covered Mount Sinai as Moses and the 70 elders traveled up the mountain. So it covers the mountain again. The, The voice of God thunders and the disciples fall on their faces in fear. Such is the glory of Christ. We're sometimes tempted to think lightly of it. We hear of Christ's glory every week and the proclamation of his word as, as the gospel goes forth. And sometimes we, we just let it go in one ear, out the other. But as we behold the glory of Jesus unveiled here, we see the appropriate response. They cower in fear. This is something that these men never forget. Unlike anything else that we see in the Gospels, the incarnate deity unveiled. His presence is transformed. His Father speaks on His behalf. His his prophets testify to His glory that He is the one in whom the whole prophetic thrust of the Old Testament is moving. He is the end, the, the telos, the goal to which all of it is moving. And the reaction that we as the readers ought to have is not unlike the disciples in verse 6. We are to be awestruck. This is meant to lead us to worship as we see who Christ truly is. It's meant to make us ask ourselves the question, am I being led to worship right now as I behold the glory of Jesus? Is my heart delighted? Is my heart filled with awe? Christ is giving us a picture of the glory that was his from eternity and also the glory that will be his for eternity. But we don't only see in these verses the glory of Christ. We also see the confusion of Christ's well-meaning disciple, the very one who was named Rock in chapter 16 after he made that confession, again becomes a stumbling stone as Peter opens his mouth In the midst of all of this, it says in verse 4, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If you wish, let us make three tabernacles, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. In Peter's defense, this is before the voice from heaven has yet spoken. It's it's as he sees Christ's glory and sees Moses and Elijah talking with him, but, but the Father at least hasn't spoken yet. But nevertheless, based on God's response in verse 5, I think we are to conclude that Peter's response here is not appropriate. And as we think about why it's not appropriate, as we think about why it is that Peter's idea to make these three tabernacles is not such a helpful suggestion, I think it's helpful to recall the context and what's just happened before this. In chapter 16, I mentioned already 
how Peter makes that great confession in Matthew chapter 16, verse 16, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. But just after Christ is declared to be the Messiah, Jesus goes on to explain how he must suffer and die. He says in verses 21 and following that he must go and suffer in Jerusalem. He must suffer many things from the elders and the chief priests and the scribes, and he must even be killed and then be raised on the third day. And boys and girls, do you remember what happens after that? Peter pulls Jesus aside. The student tries to instruct his master and says, Far be it from you, Lord, this shall not happen to you. Peter understands that Jesus is the Christ, but Peter does not yet understand the cross. Peter is excited about Christ building his church as just before that, Christ says uh, that, that I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. But Peter does not understand that Christ is going to do so through suffering. And so Jesus goes on to explain how he must suffer, but then also how his disciples must follow him in that way of suffering. Notice immediately after that, in Matthew 16, 24 through 28, Christ speaks of how they must likewise take up their cross and follow him. And so that is the context of the transfiguration of which we just read. And so could it be the case then that Peter's offer to make three tabernacles has something to do with his reluctance to follow the way of the cross. Here's how one pastor says it. Peter misunderstands the temporary nature of this glorious vision. He wants to prolong it. He wants to, to bottle it up by building many tents, many dwellings, many temples for these three holy men. By wanting to hold on to the glory of the transfiguration, Peter has no room for the glory of the cross. He wants to hold on to this moment. He recognizes the gravity and the greatness of what he's beholding, and so he wants to capture it. As so he says, let's get comfortable. Why, why don't we set up shop? Let's build some dwellings. Let's, let's take our time. Let's not be in such a hurry to, to go back to the suffering that awaits us on the bottom of this mountain where there is unbelief and misery and demon possession and a desperate father as you read of in Matthew 17 verses 14 and following. Let's stay here and enjoy the glory. And often that is our temptation too. We, we want the mountaintop experiences, but we don't want the suffering that Christ says is essential, that it is by that suffering which we share with in Christ that we are conformed into his very image. And Paul speaks of that in Romans 8. Paul speaks of that in Philippians chapter 3, of the suffering with which we must share in Christ. It is very tempting to want to live a Christian life in which we experience the ease, we experience the joy, we experience the glory, but Christ says the suffering is also essential. And the irony of all this is that Luke tells us the very thing that Moses and Elijah are discussing with Christ is his exodus. His coming death. The same thing that Christ just told his disciples about in verse 21 of chapter 16. He's been telling them about his death, and now he is speaking with Moses and Elijah about that same thing. And just as Christ is speaking about his death, his exodus, Peter says, Let's get comfortable. This shall not happen to you, Lord. Let's enjoy the glory. And then the voice from heaven thunders, this is my beloved son, hear him. Or as it says in the ESV, listen to him. Listen to him about the cross of which he is speaking in this very moment, the cross that he just told you about and that which he is speaking of right now. It's a theme all throughout Matthew's gospel. We see it in the Sermon on the Mount, the narrow way of the cross, the narrow way of the cross by which we, we um, are willing to be slapped twice on the cheek, to turn the other cheek, to be defrauded by our neighbor, to deny ourselves in that desire for glory that we so often have, to deny the, the desire for riches that we so often have. That's, that's one of the main themes in the Sermon on the Mount, the cross-shaped discipleship that Christ is calling his people to. 
You see it in Matthew chapter 8. The Son of Man has no place to lay his head to rest. The implication is that that is the same for those who follow him. We see it in Matthew 10, that sermon on suffering discipleship. As, as Christ sends his disciples out and warns them, you will be flogged in synagogues. You will be hated. You will be reviled. Matthew chapter 13, those parables of suffering as the wheat must live among the tares. And now Christ continues to speak of it as he tells his disciples, you must take up your cross and follow me. And the Father says, listen to him. Listen to him about the cross to come. That which again will be their conversation on the way down the mountain. And he says to us this afternoon, listen to him. Listen to him as he speaks to you about how the Christian life is not only a a, uh, a life of glory, like Peter wanted to sort of bottle up that glory on the Mount of Transfiguration, but it is also a sharing in the suffering of Christ. The Transfiguration calls us to reject Peter's theology of glory and embrace instead a theology of the cross. Augustine makes this point when commenting on these verses. He says, come down, Peter. Come down from the mountain. You are eager to go resting on that mountain. Come down. Toil away. Sweat it out. Suffer some tortures that by the means of the bright white clothing of the Lord you may come to possess in character what is meant by the Lord's white garments. Augustine was making the point that they are a picture of the glory of Christ that will follow his suffering. The glory of Christ that he will share with his people, but he calls us first to follow him in the way of the cross. By the way, I think this explains verse 9. Jesus instructs them there to tell no one of the glory that they have just beheld Because the people will inevitably misunderstand that glory too. They will have the same reaction as Peter. They will want to bottle it up. They'll want to make him king. And in fact, they do. But Christ says, tell no one, lest they also misunderstand. And so the confused disciples on the way down the mountain, as they seek to make sense of all of this, they ask, Jesus, why is it that the scribes say Elijah must come first. Based on Malachi 4, there was this expectation that the prophet Elijah would come and restore all things. And and so they wonder out loud to themselves, Jesus, if if it's true that that you must suffer, as you've been telling us, and and if it's true that, that we must suffer also, then why do the scribes say that Elijah will restore all things before Messiah comes? If that's the case, then how are you, the Messiah, going to be killed? If he's going to restore all things, Jesus, how are you going to die? Notice their their confusion is not merely chronological, who must come first, but their question is prompted by their inability to find any sort of framework in which the Messiah might die. They cannot reconcile the glory and the suffering. Their question betrays a fundamental inability to make sense of the combination of these two realities, suffering and glory. That's the last thing we'll consider, the paradox of the gospel, the paradox of suffering and glory. When the disciples ask Jesus this question on the way down the mountain, he tells them, Elijah already has come. That was John. John was the prophet like Elijah, but they killed him. And so the Son of Man must also suffer at their hands. Uh, John the Baptist, his death was spoken of in Matthew chapter 14. As I've been uh, preaching in our church through Matthew's gospel, we saw when we looked a few months ago at the a death of John the Baptist, a number of interesting parallels in Matthew 14 between the death of John and the death of Christ. In fact, it's interesting as you're reading through Matthew's gospel at the beginning of Matthew 14 when we're told about the death of John the Baptist that that death has already happened sometime in the past. And so Matthew seems to have an an intentional purpose in bringing up the death of John and, and the reason 
that, G, that uh, Matthew has in bringing up the death of John is that John's death itself is a sort of pointer, a sort of signpost pointing ahead to what will happen to Christ. It is a preview of what will happen to Jesus. John is a prophet of the Most High, but he, he prophesies the, the Messiah not only in the words that he speaks, but also in the very things that happen to him. Just as Christ will be seized and bound, so those exact same words are used in Matthew 14 to speak of John. Um, Just as Herod feared the crowds because they thought that John was a prophet, so later it tells us that the Pharisees feared the crowds because they thought that Jesus was a prophet. Herod, you remember, is asked by another to execute John, and he is grieved to do so. Likewise, Pilate is asked by others to execute Christ and is reluctant to do so. Um, Just as John is buried by his disciples, so Christ will be, down to the very details of Matthew 14, John's martyrdom was was represented as a a sort of pre-passion story. Exactly halfway through Matthew's gospel, a shadow is cast over the page, a, a signpost is put up, as one church father said, in those verses, Matthew gives us not only an account of John, For it was his aim in every part of his gospel to write only of Christ. And he would not have mentioned John's death if it did not relate to Jesus. Christ is making that same point again, that John's death foreshadows his. He says, just as they did whatever they wished to John, the same will happen to me. And again, just as Matthew highlighted several parallels between John's death and Christ, there are several parallels between this revelation of Christ on the Mount of Transfiguration and the greater revelation of Christ on the Mount of Calvary. There's an essay that was written called Foreshadowing the Passion about different places in Matthew's gospel where there are these these intertextual allusions pointing forward to the passion. And uh, Dale Allison, who wrote that essay, notes several parallels between Matthew 17 here and Matthew 27, which is uh, the crucifixion, Good Friday. It's the the phrase in verse 6, and they were greatly afraid, Matthew 17, 6, speaking of the disciples, and they were greatly afraid. That phrase appears only one other time in Matthew's gospel, Matthew 27, 54, the crucifixion when the centurion and those with him saw the earthquake and what took place and were greatly afraid and said, truly this was the Son of God, which is another parallel, the declaration of Christ as God's son. Allison says, I should like to raise the possibility that we have here in these parallels a sort of nudge to, to help us reflect on the one scene in light of the other. And he notes several other parallels. The number six in Matthew 17, 1 and 27, 45, the presence of three named onlookers, Peter, James, and John in Matthew 17, 1, and then the three named women in Matthew 27, 56. But then after enumerating all of these parallels between Matthew 17 and Matthew 27, he says these shared features, moreover, arouse attention because they exist in the midst of several striking contrasts. In chapter 17, Elijah appears, but in chapter 27 at the crucifixion, they mock him. And you remember what they say. They say he is calling for Elijah, but he does not appear. Little did they know. In chapter 17, Christ ascends a mountain. In chapter 27, he is raised on a cross. In chapter 17, light floods the scene, whereas in chapter 27, darkness descends. In chapter 17, Christ's garments are illumined. In chapter 27, his garments are stripped off and they they cast lots for them. In chapter 17, Christ is honored and glorified. In chapter 27, at the cross, he is humiliated and he is shamed. In chapter 17, God confesses Jesus, this is my beloved son, while in chapter 27, he seemingly abandons him. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? It's almost as if Christ loses all um, ability to comprehend his sonship, his relationship to the Father as a loving Father who pities, protects, and provides for him. In chapter 17, the disciples fall before Christ in reverent prostration, whereas in chapter 27, unbelieving soldiers fall before him in mocking prostration. 
In 17, Christ is flanked by two famous saints, Moses and Elijah, who converse with him, whereas in chapter 27, Christ is flanked by two nameless criminals who revile him. Leading us to ask the question, where does Jesus really belong? The answer is in both places. In darkness and in light, in glory and in shame, with sinners and with saints. Christ is both the mocked criminal and the exalted Lord. It is the same Jesus who is transfigured by light and wrapped in darkness, who is glorified by God and abandoned by God, who is exalted and humiliated, honored and shamed. Matthew wants us to see these two events in light of each other. Matthew wants us to behold this gospel paradox and recognize that the glory of the transfiguration is most clearly seen in the paradox of a crucified king. Chrysostom said Christ is transfigured to manifest the glory of the cross. And so when John said in John chapter 1, we beheld his glory, that is not only true of the Mount of Transfiguration, but that is also true of the Mount of Calvary. As we see this mount in light of that mount, we are meant to conclude that the cross does not show us the weakness of this Messiah, but is rather the greatest manifestation of his glory. As we behold Christ in the unveiled glory of Matthew chapter 17 and we cast a gaze at the cross of Good Friday and see the Lord of glory crying out loud shrieks on the cross, there we see glory. That's what we mean by the paradox of the gospel. Suffering and glory. We see that glory not only in the radiant clothes of verse 2 but in the clothes that are ripped off his back on Good Friday. There we see glory, and Christ calls us to follow. He says to us, as his father said to Peter, listen to him. Listen to him about the cross to come. Listen to him about the nature of true glory. Listen to him as he reveals that glory in the scandal of the cross, in in the scandal of the incarnation, where the glory of God is veiled in the frailty of human flesh, and yet paradoxically manifest in weakness. And he says to us, listen to him as that glory is proclaimed in the preaching of his word from Lord's day to Lord's day. And as you behold that glory in the preaching of the gospel, repent and believe and then follow him. Follow him trusting that transfiguration glory waits on the other side of our suffering, on the other side of our illness, on the other side of your anxiety and depression, on the other side of that marital conflict or struggles that you endure with a wayward child, on the other side of that cancer diagnosis, on the other side of miscarriage and stillbirth and infertility, on the other side of all of the the suffering that we as, as Christians may be called to share with Christ in in the years to come, He says, I I want you to cast your gaze ahead to the glory that awaits. That glory of which Paul speaks in Philippians 3, verse 21, that we will one day have our lowly bodies transformed into the same image of his glorious body. As Matthew chapter 13 says, the righteous will shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their father. That is our hope, that we will be transformed into this same glory, just as Christ shone here like the sun, Matthew 13, 43 tells us, so we will shine like the sun. But that promise is only given to those who repent of their sin and behold this crucified and risen Savior, this suffering and exalted Savior as their only hope and as their deepest joy.